It's the annual blue-white game. It has a certain feel to it today with high winds and also high drama heading into the game. I'm Thomas Frank Carr. Welcome to the Penn State Football Tailgate Show on 99.5 The Bus and also the Blue White Illustrated YouTube channel. Have a special guest with us today. Um, the tailgating, not so great today, but the bonus side of that is we're uh, now able to be joined by Landon Tangmall, former Penn State offensive lineman. He's here. We had some things going on. Uh, we were trying to get this done, and then uh, here we are. We have it done. Super excited. So, Landon, thank you for joining the show today. Thank you so much for having me, T. Frank. Uh, yeah, I had a tailgate plan. T. Frank invited me to do the show. The tailgate went by the wayside. The wind blew over <laughs> all, all the tents overnight. They were wreaking havoc down University Drive. Uh, so I am able to be here. I shot up a text this morning. So I'm glad I could be here. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, we're, we're going to be talking about a lot of stuff today, including something he and I talked about earlier this week. You're going to get a sneak preview of our conversation about Chop Robinson later during the show if you're here on the YouTube stream. But for us uh, on the radio, we're going to be breaking down for people maybe who are tuning into spring football for the first time, driving into the game in State College. Uh, you love coming to the games. Maybe you're not following along with all of the different shows or the different podcasts about Penn State football. We're going to take a look at things from a high-level perspective of Penn State has a bunch of new coordinators landed. Um how hard is that for an offense or a defense to to install a new system during the spring and then to perform in front of people for the first time uh, at the end of spring ball? What are your expectations for both sides of the ball? Today? Yeah, I think first off, it is a little bit easier for the defensive side, um, especially in spring ball. You are running a lot of base defenses. Uh, it, it's overall just easier to understand. And I, I also don't think the difference between Manny Diaz and Tom Allen is as big. Uh, as the difference between Koto Nicky and Yurcich is. Okay. I think that we're going to see a completely new look offense here. And we've heard that from Nick Singleton, from Katron Allen. Everybody's kind of went that route of saying, hey, this is going to be a completely new look offense. And I think the fans are excited about that. Uh, and obviously, we're not going to get too much of an in-depth look on that and yeah. see any type of trick plays. Um, I am excited talking to a couple different teammates of some stuff that we are putting in. Obviously, can't share any of that on, on air fully. Yeah. But definitely, I, I can tell you there's some exciting stuff that Andy Kotonicki is putting in with these players. Some stuff that we saw in Kansas uh, that we will see here. Probably won't see till week one. Mm. But, but I'm excited to see that. Uh, but overall, talking about gelling with a new coordinator, uh, it, it's difficult because you do have to get used to their coach, their coaching style, um, and, and they're completely different in how they communicate with you. Uh, you know, understanding when something goes wrong. Hey, I'm used to this coach yelling all the time. Right. Well, now this guy, he sits me down, he talks to me, and, and loves on me a little bit. So you kind of got to get used to that different feel uh, with, with a coordinator. Uh, but but overall, I think the spring game is a great time. You know, it's a great time to get used to all that, work out some of those kinks, get those young guys in. Um, Wow, I'm sorry. I just have to say this. I just watched one of our kickers put up it, from about 40 yards out. It looked completely good, and the wind just absolutely took <laughs> it back. So I don't know. The, 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 the showing from the kickers today might be a little rough, but I don't think that's on them. Yeah. That, well, that's, that's a great point because we, we are going to talk about the quarterbacks a little bit later and what to expect from them, but uh, special teams too. Kickers and quarterbacks affected by the wind, and, and fans want to see and feel comfortable about two very important positions that score a lot of points. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, expectations for today, I think you do have to adjust what you're going to see from uh, from from the point scoring part of today. So it's just it, it's going to be um, it's going to be very state college because tomorrow is supposed to be 75 and and nice. So we'll see exactly what all that's going to happen um, with uh, with what happens on the. Uh, on the show today we're going to talk about that plus of course coming up in just a minute uh we're going to take a quick break but we got to get to some of the breaking news that happened um earlier this week keandre lambert smith not currently with the football team expected to enter the transfer portal and uh we'll get a player's perspective on that i think the transfer portal in general it's good we talk about it from a third person perspective all the time what's it like from a player from somebody who is on the team and then has to sometimes make those decisions so we're going to get to all of that on the penn state football tailgate show we're here for 45 minutes heading into the network tailgate and then of course the blue white game call with steve jones and jack ham on the radio and over at bluewhiteillustrated.com we'll have coverage for you throughout the day heading into uh james franklin's press conference and beyond so stay tuned for all that um, can you kick us off with kind of your overview of where Penn State is in the class of 2025? 
Yeah, I think we're in that cycle right now where you're just trying to get to official visits. Um, you look at the losses that Penn State has had over the last couple of weeks. Matt Zoller is probably being the chief one. Uh, Trent Wilson went to Oklahoma yesterday. And and uh, Romero Eisen, probably an underrated one, a guy that I thought probably could end up in this class and all of a sudden turns on a dime uh, to uh, to USC. So I think that that's, you know, there there's definitely been some losses this week or excuse me, this uh, this month. And uh, it's. I, I don't really see it uh, abs- resolving itself uh, right away. Um, I think it's a situation where you got to look at how Penn State does things and look at the the past data that you have going with it, although it's a bit skewed now by NIL. Um, and you got to get to June if you're Penn State. And that's uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, it's going to feel like a long time. But as Ryan said last week, part of the cycle. I mean, this is a mm-hmm. situation where you've got 25 guys that commit over a 365-plus day um uh, cycle and uh, you're going to have downtimes and this is one of those downtimes and, and it's not overly worrisome because we've seen it before but at the same time it's like uh, there's a couple guys off the board that you would uh, would have penciled in this class a couple of weeks ago uh, we got Stephen Cheng uh, I had his name damn it I double clutched on it Stephen Chingaris in the chat he says spring ball is here in Happy Valley yeah so Ryan we've got uh, a list of players coming up that are going to be visiting Happy Valley this coming weekend. Um, just before we get to that at the end of the show, can you give us a preview? Good, bad, and different. What do you think about the list of players so far that you have up at bluewhiteillustrated.com? <laughs> yeah, well, actually, maybe I should grab my microphone before we start. Um, good. I, I w- it's, it's fine. I, I would say if you, if you compare it to some previous years, I don't know if it's as deep uh, as we've seen as far as just – you know, those marquee names that Penn State fans know, like there's not a Michael Carroll, there's not an Olish, there's not a, you know, some of the other regional guys that we talk about all the time. With that said, you know, Penn State got a lot of those guys on campus over the last, what, four weeks or so. And I think I haven't gone back and personally looked compared, you know, what they brought in for spring ball this year compared to what they brought in for spring practice last year, the year before, whatever it may be. But remember that first week, Man, they had like what five top 100 guys in that first week. Second week was was solid, a lot more 2026 20, quality guys for that second week. The Easter week was great, unfortunately, because that was the week that you know Sean and I both had things going on, which was unfortunate a little bit. But and then last week was kind of what you expect usually the week out from the blue white game, probably the, the, the most down, I guess, of, of the weeks. But, um, you know, I think that it's been a good four weeks for them as far as getting the guys they need to get on campus, locking in official visits, all those good things. Right now, when I look at the blue white or blue white illustrated, the blue white game list, I'd say it's down a little bit compared to what we've seen in other years. But, you know, I also you know what we got, uh, what, 48 hours. Uh, certainly probably expect a couple additions to it. Let's see where things go. Welcome back to the Penn State Football Tailgate Show. I'm Thomas Frank Carr, former Penn State offensive lineman Landon Tangwall with uh, me here. We're on the Blue White Illustrated YouTube channel. If uh, you're listening on the radio and you haven't ever heard of us before, um, hello. Hope you're enjoying your windy, cloudy spring state college day. Check out the Blue White Illustrated YouTube channel. We have a lot of great stuff, including our conversation about the reporting Blue White Illustrated did on Keandre Lambert-Smith heading into the transfer portal, his plans on uh, making that decision when the portal opens later next week. So we have the the kind of the nuts and bolts conversation, but I wanted to have a bigger conversation with Landon um, about what's it, what is what is – what is it like as a player to have to make those decisions where before that was not a, a part of the the rationale, the logic, the lexicon for a football player, and now you've got to make business decisions as a sometimes an 18, 19, 20-year-old? Mm. Um, how, how does that play for football players and when they're deciding in either the winter or the spring? Yeah, I think obviously NIL plays a huge role in the transfer portal because now, especially at places like Penn State, uh, where it's you know pe- people aren't getting these huge deals that you see these million dollar deals at, down in these SEC schools. It, it's a little bit difficult when you are you know producing and you're having some good years, or maybe you know you're you're a good wide receiver, you're an elite wide receiver like Keandre, and you're saying hey you know 
I'm not. I don't feel like I'm getting the ball enough. Wh- whatever his con- his quandaries were with, with here at Penn State, and it's like, hey, I, I can go make three hundred thousand dollars down somewhere in the SEC, down in the South. Mm-hmm. Um, so th- there is that thought too, and especially for someone that you know, especially is trying to like take care of their family, that type of thing. Yeah, it it, it stares you in the face, and I'm saying, hey, I, I can go make a quarter of a million dollars this year, but you know, before I'm even talking about the NFL. It's hard to turn down, and especially in when you're in a situation where, you know, a little bit of a love-hate, you know, relationship here at Penn State. It hasn't always been uh, the best situation for Keandre here uh, between, you know, just everything kind of going on. Uh, and I think the fans have felt that over the years. Mm-hmm. And it kind of just got to the point where I think both sides were ready to just have a, have a clean split. And honestly, I, I really don't know much internally about it. I don't know what he's planning to do. But if he does go the portal route, uh, you know, obviously I'm happy for him, but I think he's going to go find him probably more money than he was making here realistically yeah. and i think that is yeah. the big pull uh for a lot of these these other programs when you have a program like penn state where it's like hey we're gonna make sure everybody gets something take care of everybody well then that you know it takes away from other school i mean there's certain schools i i've heard michigan other places where they only pay their starters and when you only pay your starters you are able to give them a lot more and you're right. able to you know they're getting some real money but in other schools if you're if you're only get, if you're making sure it's kind of all spread out a little bit those stars aren't able to get as much so you know i i think there's that trade-off but uh, you know, it's it's definitely a difficult decision. It's not easy leaving a school because you kind of feel like you're a rookie. You're a freshman again when you head to a new school. You have to establish those relationships, learn a new playbook. So it's a hard start. But when that money is staring you in the face, it's really difficult to turn that down. And especially where you're in a situation where you don't feel like you can excel at your best, which kind of is the vibe that I, I feel like we've all gotten from Keandre Lambert-Smith. Yeah, and, uh, there's a couple things in there that I kind of want to em- uh, emphasize or underline uh, when you're when you're talking about Penn State fans may have a certain feeling about Keandre. Mm-hmm. Uh, they may feel that he has a certain skill level, um, but y- you you're saying three hundred thousand dollars. That's not a number out of nowhere. That's something that I've heard as well in terms mm-hmm. of. Uh, a market value for a guy who is a receiver, but not just that. You and I have had a conversation. He could go somewhere else and be successful. Like yeah. th- there are offenses out there where maybe it's not a great fit at Penn State, but do you think he could go somewhere and put up a thousand yards? Do you think that's a possibility? Yeah, I mean, you and me were talking about that, and I, I said that I don't want these fans when Keandre leaves if he goes somewhere and lights it up, which I think he very well could. He is a great wide receiver. He has great route running ability. Uh, He has good hands. He catches the ball very well. If he goes somewhere and lights it up, don't be surprised. But these fans then shouldn't come back and say, why why weren't we able to get this out of him or why did we let him go? Sometimes people need to go elsewhere to to get their career really going. I mean, you look at Michael Penix. I I don't think the Indiana fans were saying, hey, why weren't we able to get that out of him? It's just you have – sometimes these guys have to go and get a whole new start and be in a new system and kind of feel, okay – I have new beginnings. It's a fresh start. Let me start with this clean slate uh, and get this going. And I think that kind of that can really help a, a dude's mindset, especially when it's been kind of, you know, tarnished over the years, and you have some problems. And some you, history, yeah, some right? history, Just and you general feel like, history. Absolutely, and yeah. guys are on Twitter and stuff, and you know, certain guys will read Twitter more than others, and that resentment can build between a player and a fan base. Yeah, you see that in the NFL, but it happens in college football too. And if you, you think these players aren't seeing their comment section, they absolutely are. And, it, you know, over time, it, it can get to you. And these guys, they can say, hey, I'm not listening to that. I'm blocking out the noise. But no matter what, if you constantly see negative comments over and over in your comment section, it is going to get to you. And it's going to drive a little bit of a wedge between you and the fan base. And that can kind of trickle over to the team. Um, so it's, you know, it, it's interesting to see these type of developments but that's that's what we that's what we're dealing with now in this new uh, college football NIL transfer portal world. Right. That's that's where we're at right now. And, and I think it's important to kind of thread the needle here. Of um, he wasn't induced out of the mm. program, so this is not a pro. To to my knowledge, this is not a program coming in and saying, "Hey, Keandre, here's the money." But it is, he has the option to do Mm. this. And the relationships and everything we've kind of outlined led to this decision. But there is the reality, right, is what you're saying of, you guys know money's out there, Mm. I guess is what I'm asking. And and is that, Penn State hasn't had too many of those, it seems, but it it feels like that's a reality where maybe something that happens. Do you, what is, Uh, what is... Penn State's ability to fight that off? Is it that they're giving everybody something, trying to keep everyone uh, feeling the team love? 
Yeah, I mean, I can speak to that personally now that I'm retired. I'll, I'll talk about this comfortably. I mean, I had okay. a couple different teams come to me uh, after my sophomore year and offering good amount of money, so the same type of money we're talking about right wow. now. And, you know, I, I had no interest in doing that because I think certain guys, when they come to a place, they feel loyal. They feel like, okay, I've already kind of made my bed here. I want to continue uh, to, to build my brand. Uh, I've already had these relationships here. So that's kind of how I felt about it. But other guys, they see that money and they're kind of, they're ready to dash off. Uh, mm -hmm. On the flip side of that, when you have a guy come to the coaches and say, hey, I am getting, and this is this is part of the leverage now in NIL. Come to your coach and say, "Hey, I'm I'm getting this five hundred thousand dollar offer. I, I don't need all of that from you, but I need you to give me a little bit more because I'm making, let's say, eighty thousand dollars, and they're wanting to give me five hundred. Right, coach, I need at least two fifty from you. Right, that, I think those are the kind of conversations that are going on, and then that is where you have to go and you have to have some donors on your Rolodex. If you can go and say, "Hey." Uh, XYZ is leaving. He wants yeah. to leave. We need this money. We're counting on you as a donor. You can kind of feel those donors, make them feel a little bit special. Yeah. I uh, am kind of part of the team. And that's that's the kind of battle you're fighting now as a head coach in college football, especially if you're one of these programs. We know kind of how Penn State is. You know, we're not out here signing, you know, million dollar deals for, for every one of our players. Yeah. Um, or for recruits, right? Yeah. So, I mean, th there's, there's, an, there's another layer to this entire thing of, you know, Penn, maybe Penn State fans are a little frustrated about the recruiting that has been happening recently. Well, and I all plays a factor in that, too. Mm. So um, it's not just the clouds outside. There's a little bit of a, a cloudy forecast for the blue-white game kind of surrounding all of these things. I'm Thomas Rankar, Landon Tangwall, giving you some of that inside information about what it's like to be a Penn State football player. We're here on uh, the Penn State Football Tailgate Show. Um, we haven't even talked about football yet, Landon. I, we're, he's, he's a giant football nerd. Like oh, yeah. we were at an event uh, earlier this week, and we were doing pass rush and offensive lineman simulations in public. So, like, we love the football stuff. We're gonna get to it eventually, Landon. Absolutely. I promise. But these these conversations for people that want to be informed and give people like the the real deal, what's going on. I think that it's important to start with some of these conversations. But we're gonna get to the offense and Andy Cole, Nikki. Some of the things you said a little bit in the start about uh, what a different style coming to Penn State. Maybe we'll see. A, a smattering of that today. Maybe. We'll find out. Um, but we'll talk about that next on the Penn State Football Tailgate Show here on the Blue White Illustrated YouTube channel and 99.5 The Bus. We get to play my favorite game, which is the top five game. Number five. Okay, so we're going to be counting down uh, the top five players uh, that these guys are interested in seeing during the blue-white game. And then we're going to be talking about uh, different storylines that are coming up in the game as well. So, um, Nate, I'm going to come to you. Yeah. Who is your number five player you're looking for? Zaki Wheatley. Ooh, tell me why. Zaki? Zaki. Okay. Yeah. I always thought it was Zaki, but I don't know. I talked to his dad one there's, time, and I still don't there's know. There's different <laughs> pronunciations out there. Uh, why? Because yeah. if you watched the highlight reel that Penn State released this morning. Or uh, read any of our coverage this spring. <laughs> either first. one. Like, you could have seen that today or known about it three months ago. But anyway, it doesn't matter. It's not a big deal. Uh, he's been great. He's been, he's really, right? I mean, it, it, everything's being framed in terms of the light coming on, and right? And it's not about his natural talent. That has always been there. It's yep. about your uh, commitment, dedication, right? Seriousness of all the other stuff, right? All the other things that go into being uh, successful at this level. He has done those things. He's just, he's just in it. And so uh, do I want to see that on Saturday? Yeah, for sure. See what that looks like. Yeah. Um, what do you think is the key in, in his opportunity this year in the defense with Tom Allen? That is the key right there is like, how do you keep a third safety first off on the roster in the portal age and but also engaged like yeah you play three safeties and you play it effectively and he's done that um and as nate mentioned you know we talked to some people this offseason and you look at what he did in 2023 and took a i mean i don't want to say took us took a step back but he got beat on some plays yeah he got his playing time diminished and by the end of the season it was basically all jalen reed and kj winston yeah those guys are back so what are you thinking going in the offseason it's either okay maybe this isn't the spot for me or I can really figure this out and be a, a, a huge asset to this defense. He picked the latter, which is good. Um, a lot to work for, a lot of potential turnovers in this defense. Like you look at how they plan to play these safeties, and you're going you're gonna to see Jalen Reed all over the field. You're going to see um, K.J. Winston pretty much all over the field, I think. Yeah. But also you've got that deep 
center fielder as he's been the guy that has magnetically attached to the football as, as they've said uh, throughout the last several years um, have an opportunity to, to sort of clean up and I think yeah. he's going to have that I think he's going to have a chance to do that Nate mentioned the, the video that they put out on practice today or from from spring practice today he was all over the place uh, and that's a good sign not going to see much of KJ Winston if at all uh, yeah. this weekend hand in a cast um, so yeah I'm excited to see K, uh, Zaki as well it's an interesting situation with a guy who flashed early as you guys mentioned but the ball skills that he has and his ability to get the football is a game-changing thing for a defense. He might not even be the top safety on the team, but he could also be the most impactful guy on the team. It's a fascinating situation. Who's your number five? Yeah, and by the way, he would he wouldn't would not surprise me if he led the team in interceptions as a third safety. Yeah. Like that's that's kind of the situation that he's gonna be put in. So Welcome back to uh, the Penn State Football Tailgate Show. I'm Thomas Frank Carr, Landon Tangwall, former Penn State offensive line m- lineman with you. We're talking about the offense, and again, we were going to talk about Andy Cole, Nicky, some of the high-level stuff, but we're just going to get into the roster for today because I I feel like Charlie Brown with the football, and it's not just because I'm bald now. Um, it's because James Franklin, I, Landon, I believe people when they tell me stuff. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a gullible person. It's your first mistake, T. Frank. So, James Franklin on Wednesday talked about, or excuse me, on Tuesday talked about how this is going to be a competitive team. He talked about, like, for example, the defensive tackles. There's four of them that they consider starters. Um, and that those guys are going to be split up. Landon, mm. oh, the, the roster came out yesterday. The white team's just the starters, right? Like, I'm, I'm looking at this and I, I don't see anything, like, competitive about these rosters. <laughs> yeah, I, I have to agree with you there. I think it's a little bit better than last year. And okay. I, I talked about this on one of my podcasts. The format last year was ones and threes versus the twos and the fours. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, you know, that was that was okay. But it, honestly, going into it, I wasn't that – I was locked in. But I'm like, okay, I'm going against – at the time, it was a young Caleb artist. And I'm like, all right, I don't got to go against Devon or Hakeem. I'm pretty much chilling today. That was kind of my thought process. So yeah. I think when you see that you don't have to go up against another one, mm-hmm. it, it's like it doesn't bring out as much competition. Um, but I, I know I'm looking at the roster too, and it's like the blue team has two tight ends. The white team has five tight ends. <laughs> so if the blue team is out here running running any type of like two tight end sets, dude, they're going to be gassed out there. They might have to switch some jerseys off. Of, I, I don't I don't understand the makeup of some of that. Um but, yeah, man, these rosters are interesting. Also, just to update the fans, it looks like Katron Allen is in street clothes, mm-hmm. so he won't be missing today, but it'll give us a chance to see some of these younger running backs. Yeah, we got a couple guys. J.B. Nelson I see also out there in street clothes. They're, they're wearing tan track suits. Like, the swag is a little bit different this year. We, we, you and I were talking about this, mm-hmm. the, uh, the non-contact quarterback jerseys. They're uh, they're not the gray. They're this interesting blue. I I, I kind of dig the way that they're going this year with some of their uh, some of the stuff you're going to see during the blue white game from a style perspective. Yeah, I, I like it a lot too. Um, it, it looks nice. Just updating a couple other things that we're seeing. Um, it looks like Hakeem Beeman will be out today as well, so we won't get a look at him. But that's I think that's all right. I was talking about a couple sixty year guys. Mm-hmm. I don't know if Sal Wormley's going to make it out today. The, those guys, honestly, they really don't need to be out here. We know what they are and what we're going to get from them. Yeah. And honestly, spring ball starts to become a more when you're managing those six fifth, <laughs> fifth and six year guys. Yeah. It's more please don't get hurt. We need you for the season. Yeah. Uh, so I, I don't think the fans should worry about that at all. One guy I'm excited to look at though, and I know we're going to talk about actual football here in a second. But Smith Vilber has put on some significant weight. He's down yeah. here right on the 20-yard line. Yeah. He is up to like 285, yeah. and it's looking like he's going to get some work at 3-tech. Interesting. So I, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see what he's going to do. He is a very quick, agile dude. Um, so, uh, you know, it looks like with Akeem out, we might get a little more action from Smitty there. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, look, shaping up to be an interesting day, man. Yeah, he's been a guy that um, I think from some of my coworkers at BlueWhiteIllustrated.com, they've heard a little more about Smith Vilber than we were expecting. And, and I think that that's both good and bad uh, when you talk about some of the young mm-hmm. guys behind the four starters, Zane Durant, Hakeem Beeman, Devon Ellis, and uh, Zariah. No. Because I is sorry. Yeah. Um, you know, the, who, who's going to be that next wave? And if another six-year guy is, is one of the guys that's going to be part of the conversation, um, we'll see. You know, mm-hmm. not nothing set in stone, but we'll see today because that's definitely going to be part of what we're looking at today. But let's talk about the offense. Mm-hmm. Uh, Andy Kotelnicki bringing in, um, uh, from a negative view, you could say, oh, here's another Big 12 offense. How's that going to translate to the Big Ten? But um, I think from my view of film, and I think from what you've said, some genuinely different dynamic and and uh, interesting things. 
what is your opinion of the offense as you've seen it? Yeah, I mean, the first thing, you talking about Big 12 offenses, and when Yurcich came in, everybody was really excited, and it was this big hype that he's coming from Oklahoma State, this explosive offense, and he's going to bring a lot of this creativity. And honestly, I, I felt like we didn't see a ton of that. Um, so I think some fans are weary to put all their trust in Andy Kotonicki and be like, and, and just be all excited. They say, you know, we want to see something first. Yeah. So, uh, like I said, I think this is going to be a completely new-look offense, and we heard that from the players, Nick Singleton, uh, among others, Bo Prabula. It, it's exciting. And the stuff that you, T. Frank over here has gotten at practice, we see the quarterbacks getting involved a lot in the run game. Yeah. It looks like there's going to be a ton of read option as well as, you know, read option, pulling it, and then having someone maybe on an orbit option pitching yeah. it. I mean, it's definitely going to be creative. Um, I, I think also – the past couple years, we have been heavy inside zone teams. Yes, I don't think yeah. we're. I don't think we're going to get away from that necessarily. But I do think Andy Kotonicki's offense. We are going to be getting outside, outside, outside. Yep. We are going to see outside zone. We're going to see pin and pull. That's where you see a couple linemen blocked down, and then guards and ta guards and centers are kind of pulling around, getting outside. That is where you need to get Nick Singleton, those type of guys in yep. space. Um, get your playmakers the ball in space and let them do something. I think we didn't see that enough early in the season last year. And then when Sider and Hal took over, it, you started to see those bigger plays pop. And now, granted, it wasn't too much, uh, you know, too much of a significant change. But you look at that 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 Nick Singleton pop popping out the pass to him in the flat against Michigan State and yep. Tyler Warren burying someone and him taking off for 50, 60 yards. I think we're going to see more of that type of stuff. Andy Kotonicki is big in the screen game too. I don't expect to see a lot of screen game today because screen game, you don't have a ton of them, mm -hmm. and he's not going to want to show his hand uh, on plays that, especially screens, you're trying to catch people off guard. Yeah. You, you don't want to really showcase those. So I, I, a lot of this I wouldn't expect to see. But there's some stuff I'm excited to see, like – Vanguane in motion, pulling, cracking down on the DN, yeah. that type of stuff, those two quarterback looks. None of that stuff I think we'll see today. Like I said, it's going to be very vanilla, and Coach Kotonicki has said that. Mm -hmm. But uh, I definitely think overall this offense is going to look different. I, I think the fans are just excited for something fresh and something new yeah. and, and a spark that Coach Kotonicki is going to provide to this offense. And, and so to kind of follow up on that, when James Franklin says in the offseason, the offense isn't changing all that much. We're not mm -hmm. doing a lot of different things. That's what he's talking about because last season at Urate, inside zone was a, was a big part of what they mm -hmm. did the last several years. But one of the things that I had been tracking is uh, – Mike Yersich used a lot of outside zone mm -hmm. at uh, Oklahoma State and then started to integrate more of that, more of that. And then last year, they really were just kind of inside and outside zone. Like, a lot of it was, like, some of that stuff on the inside and then a lot of outside zone. I guess my question is, um, and you don't have to give me the technique they're using, but mm -hmm. are there different techniques to be even more extreme in terms of moving laterally in that zone formation. So for fans that don't know mm. what we're talking about, a zone scheme is your, uh, and I'm going to simplify this. I apologize if oh, I brutalize it. it. Um, you're running laterally. You're getting to the sideline, creating lateral distortion is how Mike, uh, uh, <laughs> I'm called this, <laughs> Mike Yersich. Um, uh, Andy Kolnicki uh, explains it, like that lateral movement. Are there different techniques where maybe Mike Yersich uses certain things that keeps it a little tighter and then you can get even more aggressive with that this year where it's even more noticeable they're running laterally. Yeah, I think the first thing is that there's always variations off of a play. Look, any offense, you have the base plays. You have inside zone, outside zone, some type of mid zone, and then you have those power and counter runs. And what makes offenses different, different is those variations you use off of that. So there are certain things that you can do. So let's say you are a play side guard and the center. So you're running to the left, your left guard and, and center. And you would normally have a double team up to the backer that's right, right in front of you to the left. Well, you can do some variations. Let's say you get a Tyler Warren, a Khalil Dinkins, and put them in the backfield. Mm -hmm. And it's almost an insert block. Yeah. So instead, that double team that would be going front side is now going to the backside linebacker. And we're inserting Tyler Warren, somewhat, some type of fullback, and you're inserting them up into the middle uh, to go block that. And it can create a little bit more explosion. Um, it changes the angles for the yeah, offensive line? Absolutely. It yeah. changes the blocking scheme. Now you're blocking back instead of blocking kind of forward. It can create a little bit more space for the running back and allow that, that run to hit a little bit easier. And then there's also, it, from my understanding, Coach Kotonicki has said this to, to many of people, we are never going to stop moving. And when he says that, he is talking about pre-snap motion. Yeah. Um, and, and that's something we see a lot from these 
Kyle Shanahan, uh, from Andy Reid, those, those big time uh, offensive, you know, basically offensive coordinators in the NFL. Yeah. Um, and I think he kind of wants to bring that here to Penn State. And like I said, he wants to provide a new look to this Penn State offense. So as much as you can put the defense at a disadvantage uh, and and make them respect their rules, and when I say that, linebackers, they have keys that they have to follow. If, if there's a tight end coming in motion, coming in a split flow, and that's when a tight end, you know, pre-snap or really right at the snap of the ball might come across the line of scrimmage, the linebackers have to respect that and they have to move. Yeah. So you can kind of dictate how you want to set up the defense uh, by that pre-snap motion. So there's a lot of things Andy Kotonicki can do with that, and I'm excited to see. I do think we'll see a lot of that pre-snap motion today because that is something that is a base <laughs> it's, part of the offense. It's, it's built baked in. in. Absolutely. Yeah. It's so, baked into what he yeah. likes to do. Mm. Um, and, and we're going to talk about that defense coming up next. There's oh, you, you notice we talked a lot about the running game, which is what I think we're going to see a lot of today. Now, the passing game and how Drew Aller fits into all that, how Bo Prabula fits into all that. We're going to come back and talk about who we're looking for at the end of the show. So we're not done talking about the offense, but we do want to give the defense their love, talk about um, some of the things that you might be able to see from this particular team coming up. That's next here on the Penn State Football Tailgate Show on 99.5, the bus and the Blue White Illustrated YouTube channel. Oh, you put, you you went there with this game. <laughs> you went there. I know. It's, it, dude, it's a sore subject for some people, but I mean, it's some good tape on, on the defense, especially yeah. Early on, but it's it, it's a hard one to watch. Trust me, to watch the full game, it doesn't feel good. Again, especially watching the all twenty two, it really doesn't feel good. <laughs> so this is okay. Um, I have some weaknesses in in my personal uh feeling for certain positions and, and certain things. Mm. Growing up, I wanted to be a wide receiver. So like you've seen me in person, that was not going to happen. Um, just with my size and my build. Um, but I love speed rushers and you talked about bending the edge with chop a lot so when i see a guy that can bend the edge i'm like say no more here 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 i am um i guess talk uh, show us some of the things that he does that um maybe other defensive ends can't do um mm. i know we've talked about it already but there's just there's there's that particular phrase bending the edge you hear that with mm. every elite defensive end in the nfl or in college and I guess when you're talking about him as a late first round pick and you hear something as critical as that, um, can you kind of bridge the gap in terms of like what he does and, and where he is in that journey? Yeah. So chop is just his natural ability. His athletic ability is amazing. That, that get off is not coachable. That's just, that's just, he grew up with that. He's had that since high school and his ability to, to stay low to the ground and kind of that body position that he puts himself in that we were talking about earlier that's all really uncoachable stuff. You can try to get a guy to do that type of stuff, but it's so natural to him. That's why he's such an elite edge rusher. Um, but, you know, sorry, you can go back a little bit. Oh, okay. Just to the start. Okay. Um, I, well, I mean, one thing I don't get to a lot from a lot of these tackles is they, they were not deep setting chop at all. And the one thing about offensive tackles particularly is they always say set to your spot. So that means get to your spot between you and the defensive, you and the quarterback and the defensive end, like pick that spot that you need to get to where you can, you can make contact and settle and you're in a good position. So this offensive tackle clearly, I mean, obviously chop got a great jump here, but he needs to be getting a lot more vertical to be able to cut this off the angle that chops taking. And this is kind of why I say, if you see how chops facing him too, it looks very threatening. But Chop does a great job of like keeping his shoulder pads and helmet towards the quarterback on that 45 degree, but he goes vertical still. Like we talked about him creating that width, that width in that rush. Interesting. You see that? How he's rushing straight yeah. up, but his body is facing it, it's very deceitful to an offensive lineman because it looks like he's coming right at you. So you're getting ready and you're kind of tempoing down that set a little bit. But in reality, Chop is still going straight up the field. He, it's just kind of a, it's a little bit of illusion. And the so next thing you know, independent, his, his shoulders and hips are working independently mm -hmm. in this situation. Absolutely. Wow. It's the Penn State football tailgate show. Uh, it, it's, it's exciting. We're getting closer and closer to kickoff and we've got a lot to talk about. We have too much to talk about, honestly, for a 45 minute tailgate show. So let's get right into it, Landon. Uh, we're going to talk about the defense, Tom Allen. Um, what do you think about the, the new scheme with uh, the former Indiana head coach? 
Yeah, like I said, I said this earlier, I don't think we're going to see too much of a drastic change to just the naked like fan eye. I don't think it's going to be too big of a change as far as scheme goes, especially in this blue-white game where it's everything's a little bit vanilla, um, not a ton of exotic blitzes. We'll still see that, that, that third down front where we have you know seven up and we're trying to confuse the offense a little bit. I think we'll still see that, and we're not getting away from that at all. Not something that Tom Allen ran at Indiana, but I don't think he had that personnel to be able to run yeah. it. And, you know, you get here, you have these type of athletes where you can move guys around, uh, some really talented edge rushers. Where I'll, well, actually, I'll too, just, too many good defensive linemen. Somebody's yeah. not going to be on the field on third down. It's amazing. You're absolutely right. Just uh, real quick, I just want to say, just got a quick look at Abdul uh, in pass rush here against going against Javen Williams a second ago. Uh, looked pretty good, really explosive off the ball. Javen actually kind of locked him up. Uh, but uh, Abdul's looking good. Excited mm -hmm. to see that hand usage today. Yeah. Um, we, we talked about this a little bit. I'm, I want to see how he's going to be able to set up the offensive tackle because it's very different. And we were just talking about that seven-up look, and that's a lot of the time this past year in his freshman year where Abdul got to rush the passer. Yep. And he was standing up over the center, over the guard, sometimes doing a lot of, uh, of like looping out, a lot of stunts. Yep. And now it is you were lining up against the offensive tackle for 60, 70 snaps, 30 of them are going to be pass rush. Okay, now you're not going to get a sack every play. You're not only rushing. You're not rushing two or three times a game. It's yeah. 30 pass rushes. How can you set up an offensive tackle? What type of moves are you going to use? Can you understand making sure you keep contained, not being too aggressive, and, and letting quarterbacks burn you? So I'm excited to get a good feel of how Abdul's going to be at defensive end. Uh, it, it should be a, a, a good look today and a good test, and it looks like he's going to be going against Javen Williams, which I think is going to be a good test. It looks like one of them's in blue, one of them's in white. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm excited for that, and I think we'll get a look at Nolan Rucci too uh, yeah. against Abdul and Denai. So we, I tweeted that out earlier this week. Uh, that's I mean, Obviously, I'm a little biased. I'm an offensive lineman, but I am <laughs> excited for these offensive tackles yeah. who are young and kind of unproven uh, to, to, to go against Denai and Abdul. Uh, which there's still some question marks there for them. I mean, uh, Denai is obviously a very elite pass rusher, but now it is time for him to take that big step in year three. Guy. Absolutely, yeah. and I think it's it's a lot easier. And I think that's the theme for a lot of this Penn State team, whether they're headed into year two or year three. Look at Tony Rojas headed into year two. Denai yep. headed into year three. Uh, there's a, a duel headed you know into year three, but now at DN. It's now this this pressure is on them. KJ Winston headed into year three. I think we know what we have from KJ. But now when you're the guy and the focus is on you and teams are game planning, how do we put this guy at a disadvantage? It, it becomes a little more difficult. And I think we saw that with something like Kalen King, who we thought was undoubtedly a first-round draft pick, yeah. and now he's looking at maybe even day three. And it, that, that, that type of stuff hurts, but sometimes when you go into that sophomore or junior year, when those expectations are high and you have been a freshman or a sophomore, whatever your scenario is where there was not a ton of pressure on you the year before and you were able to perform a little bit, um, it, it becomes a lot harder when it's, hey, we are counting on you yep. to make this play with two minutes left against Ohio State. Like, you need to come through for us. And some guys don't do well handling that. So I'm excited to see, especially on defense, we have a lot of guys heading to year two and year three that need to step up. And today's that first look at this. It's, it's somewhat of a new-look defense. We lost a lot of guys, especially in that secondary. The wind is obviously not very conducive in, uh, in in us getting a good look at these wide receivers and DBs. Yeah. But these cornerbacks, man, that all those positions are up for grabs. I mean, there is six, seven guys deep on that cornerback depth chart that who knows who could pop out and end up being the, the, the two main starters uh, on both ends, replacing Johnny Dixon and Kalen King. So uh, I'm excited to get a good look at that and see how these guys are preparing. I'm interested, and this is something I'm thinking about, uh, we're going to – Take a quick break after this and then come back for uh, who we're looking for in this game. Just going to put this in your brain, and I'm going to put this in the brain of the fans. Um, one of the differences that I've noticed from Tom Allen is that there's a lot more reliance on the guys up front to be the guys up front and, and less run blitzing, less stunting, mm -hmm. less movement on the defensive line. Uh, denies 270. I think Abdul could be 260. Is this a team that can dominate up front in the run game and the pass game with just four? Because if they can... I think there's some creative things they can do on the back end that maybe some of those things don't matter as much. Mm -hmm. The coverages has some, you have some more players to play with on the back end. Uh, now those guys have to go do it. 
right? Those mm-hmm. guys have to step up like you just talked about. But I think it's a very interesting mix of players up front and the depth at the defensive end position. We're going to talk about players that we're interested to see specifically during this game, see how they perform. I'm watching uh, the pistol formation down there at the goal mm-hmm. line. I love this. We are looking at some football. It's right here on the Penn State Football Tailgate Show on the Blue White Illustrated YouTube channel and 99.5 The Bus. Thank you to A. Campbell. He says lots of positives. AJ Harris, Julian Fleming, negatives, Manny Diaz, and Keandre Lambert-Smith. We'll see again. We're not putting that as an ultimate it is happening with Keandre Lambert-Smith. Check out the first part of the video. But probably. Um, but, but probably. You know, but that's the journalist responsibility thing to do. Yeah. Um, has your outlook for 2024 gone up or down since the bowl game? This is an interesting question. Fitz, what do you think? It really hasn't changed for me. Um, you can take a certain amount away from spring, but at the same time, the optimism is – is just that on the offensive side of the ball. Like we we all want to see explosive plays because we want to watch fun football, basically. Yep. And there were times last year where it was just not fun. Um, so I haven't changed, but I you know you just want to you just want to see proof of concept, I guess. You've seen Kansas film, you've seen Buffalo film, where it's yep. fun to watch his offense, uh, Andy Kodernicki's offense, in action. You want to see that at Penn State. I mean, and, and until you get to fall camp, I don't know that there's much that you can change about that. Uh, you know, Tom Allen's a great coach. Uh, Manny Diaz was a great coach. I feel solid about the defense. Doesn't like, matter. Nobody, <laughs> nobody cares that we're going to talk about the defense because yeah. they just feel, you know, taking it for granted is what is what we do. So it's kind of where we're at with that. I haven't changed much in terms of my outlook on the season. I just want to continue to hear more. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you the fire. Uh, All right. Has my outlook changed on 2024 from August 2023? Yes. Why? Negatively. Yeah, why? <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry. I knew by the look in your face you were going to say negatively, but why? Right? W- w- what's your reasoning? Uh, a variety yeah. of things. I think that we had thoughts about what everyone would be going into 2023 that in some cases panned out and in other cases didn't. Right? Mm-hmm. And so now you're throwing in the introduction of, I, I mean, I literally just heard Carl Nassib talking about it the other day, about how he spent his entire career not having a defensive coordinator two years in a row and how impactful that was on yeah. his career. I, I think it is naive to treat this as though Andy Kotelnicki is going to come in and they're going to fly. I, I just, I do. I, I think that is a, a naive way to look at it. I think there's going to be growing pains. Yes, you want to speed up that process as much as you possibly can. Yeah. But is 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 Drew the guy that we thought he could be today That in August 2023? I'm not sure. Right? Yeah. Uh, Singleton was not at the level. Right. He didn't overcome situationally to still be great, which some guys can do. And it was a harder situation. Yep. Uh, The receiver's room isn't better. It's not not demonstrably better. You're not able – like, I can't pick out and say, hey, this is a deficiency from last year that is obviously improved, right? Incrementally, maybe. Sure. Like, I'll definitely give them that. I think that that the development side of the – Welcome back to the Penn State Football Tailgate Show. I'm Thomas Frank Hart, Landon Tangwall with me, former Penn State offensive lineman. We're coming here to the end. The Blue White game is about to start. They're going into the tunnel for the introductions later. So, Landon, we're talking about who we're looking for. Offense, defense, give me one player on each side of the ball that you're going to be looking for and why. Yeah, first, I'm looking on the offensive side of the ball. With the departure of Keandre Lambert-Smith, uh, looking at the wide receiver group, I am really excited for Caden Saunders. Yes. I think someone – yeah, you like that one? I That's, like that one, I yes. think he's a real underrated guy, man. Had the only touchdown in the Ohio State game last year. Um, and he is so shifty and a, such an elite route runner, especially from that slot position. I think he can have a big effect, and especially in today's game. Like I said, Keandre out, a couple wide receivers are, are maybe aren't hurt, not playing. I think he could have a really good impact. I'm excited to see what he can do this year. We talked about – Wide receivers helping Drew out, making plays for him. Let's see what Caden Saunders can do today. I'm excited for that. Flip side, defensive line I'm looking at. I Everybody's excited about Abdul, Deny, seeing those dudes. I want to see Jameel Lines. Mm. I think this kid, I just saw him make a nice little play down there, right, shedding in the run. He is really talented, big and strong. I got to go against him a couple times. 
pull on him. He can take on some pulls. He can set the edge, and he can rush the passer. So I'm excited to see what Jameel Lines is going to do today. That is going to do it for us here on the Penn State Football Tailgate Show. So take a look at those guys. And, of course, uh, if you want to join us, there's a post-game show afterwards on 99.5 The Less. We will have post-game content as well at bluewhiteillustrated.com. James Franklin's press conference going up as well. we got all kinds of stuff for you here. So enjoy the blue-white game from us here to you. We'll talk to you later.